of the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans, or NCAPA. Uh, my name is Ian Rick John. I am the policy director at the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum, uh, located in Oakland. And I also serve as the NCAPA Health Committee co-chair, along with Isha Weirsing, our the senior policy analyst at the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, or APCHO. Before we get into the main content for our webinar today, um, I've asked Kelly Honda, who is the Policy and Membership Manager of NCAPA, to provide just a brief overview of NCAPA for those of you who may not be familiar with this coalition. Um, and Isha is also going to uh, give a brief um, overview of what the Health Committee is, what the Health Committee does, and some of our priorities for 2015. After that, I'll introduce our featured speaker for today and turn the time over to him. Um, just a couple of things about the webinar. It will be recorded and will be available on the NCAPA website um, if, if you have other people that, are, that you know of that might be interested. And we will also have time at the end of the webinar for questions. So you will see a uh, question box on your screen. If at any time during the webinar you know a question pops into your head during the presentation, please type that question into the box and we'll, we'll take questions at the end. Um, if questions are, if we have questions in the middle that, that maybe we can address during the presentation, we'll also address those as they come up. So please use that question box. Um, and with that, I will turn it over now to Kelly to give a brief overview of NCAPA. Kelly. Hi, thanks Ian so much and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, today for this great webinar and uh, for everybody who's presenting today, uh, Kevin, thank you so much for um, coming to speak to our community members to give us a better uh, insight on mental health. Um, so just a brief background on National Council of Asian Pacific Americans. Uh, we were founded in 1996 to serve as the organized national voice of Asian Americans and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander issues. Uh, we're based here in Washington, D.C., and we uh, consist of a coalition of 35 national um, Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander organizations around the country. Um, and we just recently uh, brought in another member, and so our reach is uh, here on the mainland and uh, Hawaii and Guam. And if you go to the next slide. Um, so our goals uh, at NCAPA are to strive for equity and justice through organization of our diverse strengths. We work with partners on Capitol Hill, including the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, um, in the White House, including the White House Initiative on Asian Pacific Americans, and, um, the federal, and federal partners in uh, various government agencies. Um, we do all this work uh, to advance policies and issues related to the AA and NHPI communities. You can go to the next slide. And so we, um, and CAFA is structured um, with an executive committee and five policy committees, um, which are all run by our chaired and comprised of our NCAPA members. And they're supported by a team of full-time staff uh, that includes two policy members managers and uh, one communications associate. And we're in the process right now of bringing on our new national director. Um, so our policy committees are civil and human rights, education, health, housing and economic justice, and immigration. And uh, we also address, uh, through our members, other issues that don't fall under these committees, but these are our main uh, basic issues. Um, and uh, if you're looking for our website later to find the uh, the recording, our website is ncapaonline.org. I will turn it over to Isha. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I'm going to be quick because we're looking forward to Kevin's presentation. So just to give you an overview about the NCAPA Health Committee. Um, so the Health Committee is comprised of 16 groups. Um, together we work uh, to support the health policy priorities of our organization, which include um, what you see on the slide here. Uh, that includes, you know, ACA implementation, um, focusing on culturally and linguistically um, competent healthcare and enrollment, um, and we do that through conversations that we have through federal agencies uh, and the White House. 
Um, we work uh, to reduce health disparities and expand access to pre preventive services, um, and that's through um, our coalition and through our partners, and again through those conversations with federal partners. And then we also work on data advocacy, um, supporting the uh, dis disaggregated race and ethnicity data for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Next slide, please. So um, because the priorities of these 16 groups are so many and um, vast, uh, we decided to focus on three priorities for 2015. And those include um, opposing PRENDA, um, supporting healthcare access for DACA DAPA recipients, and um, working on language access and the ACA. Uh, that does not mean, as you all are here uh, to to learn more about AAPIs and mental health, that we're not supporting other of our other priorities. But um, we feel that it's important to for our uh, organizations to come together um, to focus on on a few things. So these, this is what the committee decided on this year. So with that, if you have any questions, um, as Ian said, um, he'll he'll present um, our information next. Thank you, Kelly and Isha. And yes, as you can see, there our contact information is there if you have any other questions. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over now to Kevin. I'm going to give a just a brief introduction, and then I'll turn the time over to him. So our speaker today is Dr. Kevin Nadal. Um, Kevin currently serves as Associate Professor of Psychology at the City University of New York, and he's the incoming president of the Asian American Psychological Association. He also serves as the Executive Director of the Center for LGBTQ Studies. So Kevin, um, go ahead, and the time is yours. Great. Okay. So thank you so much to NCAPA for having me, to the Health Committee for having me. Um, thanks so much to Ian and Isha and Kelly. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk for the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, I know that for me, webinar is always a little weird. I feel like I'm just talking to myself. So I like using the interactive tool on the right. Um, so in that chat box, can people just tell me where you're coming from, like what city or state you're in? Um, I could start right where I am. Does that work, or is that taking too while, a while for people to see? No? OK. Is it coming up? Yeah. OK. okay. So while, while you're doing I see Denver, Massachusetts. OK. Massachusetts. OK, I can't see any of that. So you will just tell me about that later. Um, <laughs> but uh, I uh, also just want to encourage you to tweet along with the hashtag AAPI Mental Health. Um, so that people who aren't able to join us today uh, can hear a little bit about what we talked about today. So feel free uh, to do that. So I'm going to talk um, about Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and mental health, um, particularly in addressing the stigma. So as you know, um, within our various communities, uh, that talking about mental health is something that people don't tend to do. Um, and so today, I hope, can be at least the first step in trying to uh, start that conversation. So the outline for today is as such, so I'm briefly going to introduce myself uh, a little bit more and then the Asian American Psychological Association. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the cultural context for Asian American Native Hawaiians and uh, Pacific Islander communities. I'll talk a little bit about our community's beliefs about mental health and psychotherapy, and then maybe start to talk a little bit about how to address mental health issues on individual, community, and federal levels. Um, so just a little bit about me, um, not the professional stuff, but the personal stuff. Um, I'm Filipino American and second generation. I grew up in the Bay Area, California. Um, I, my parents uh, immigrated um, in the mid-1960s after the Asian um, American, or the Asian Immigration Act of 1965, which allows Asian Americans to enter the country um, at large, in larger numbers. Um, and so um, I grew up very bicultural, um, knowing what it meant to be American, to grow up in, in an environment uh, where we watched uh, American television shows, listened to American music, we went to our schools, and we spoke English only, um, and then to go back home and then to live in, in an immigrant household where my parents spoke primarily um, their native language, uh, where we upheld many cu cultural customs and traditions, um, where um, many times cultural values that we upheld in our uh, families was often in direct opposition to what we learned in 
the school system. So for example, in the school system, we're taught to uh, speak our minds, to raise our hands, to be vocal, um, to, uh, to think about what's best for you and your future. Um, but in your families, you might be taught to be collective, um, to be obedient, to uh, defer to your authority figures and to your parents particularly, um, to respect your elders and so forth. And so sometimes being bicultural meant that you had to navigate with both of those things. Um, and so today, um, I hope that you can all start to think about your own personal experiences. So for those of you who are Asian American, um, Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian, um, to think about how the, some of those earlier experiences have shaped not just your identity and your personality and um, some of your core values, um, but also how it may have affected your ability to, to view mental health as uh, something that's important or, um, or to talk about mental health in, in open ways. So I'm briefly going to talk about the Asian American Psychological Association. So we were founded in 1972 um, by many activist scholars in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, Gerald Wing Su is the first, or was the first president of AAPA. Um, he's now one of the most distinguished multicultural psychology scholars in the country. Um, he's also my mentor at Columbia University. Um, the AAPA started as, with a history of advocacy, um, where a bunch of Asian American psychologists were recognizing um, that there wasn't any education or training for uh, bilingual or bicultural providers, um, particularly Asian or Asian American um, service providers, um, and they really advocated for the establishment of ethnic-specific clinics. So you'll see that there are a lot of uh, cities across the country in which there might be um, ethnic-specific clinics that serve various Asian American communities, and that really started in, as part of advocacy um, in the 1970s um, from various uh, Asian American psychologists and social workers and other um, uh, helping professions who really saw the need for us to, to have our own clinic. Um, we've had a lot of uh, notable leadership in AAPA. Um, Richard Schwinn was the first president uh, of the American Psychological Association who was Asian American, and that was in 1999. Um, Nolan Zane runs the Asian American Center on Disparities Research at UC Davis. Alvin Alvarez is the dean of senior, uh, San Francisco State University, um, and Lark Wong uh, is a senior uh, officer at SAMHSA. Um, our membership is about 500. We have divisions on various uh, special interests. We have the Asian American Journal of Psychology, which was established in 2009. Uh, this past year, it was ranked the number one ethnic studies journal in the country. Um, our impact factor for people who know or care about that, it's, it's pretty high. It's 1.67. Um, and we have various task forces, um, fact sheets focusing on uh, various issues affecting the Asian American community. One of the reasons why we did our fact sheet series um, is because uh, there are so many myths about Asian Americans that people um, just hear or and, and also then uh, tell others about, um, but we wanted to, to really just provide factual information. So there, there are these two to three page fact sheets um, that can provide information on these various topics and others, and then our website is listed there. So one of the things that we are doing is we're trying to give Asian American psychology away, and one of the ways that we do that is to talk about mental health issues in our advocacy work. Um, so we joined in CAVA last year. Um, we're the member of the, the Alliance of National Psychological Associations for promoting racial and ethnic equity. Um, so for that, we work with other ethnic minority psych associations, including the Association for Black Psychologists, the National Latino Psychological Association, um, and the Society of Indian Psychologists. Um, and we do various projects. So this upcoming year, we're working on a project with the Annie Casey Foundation to focus on juvenile justice and ethnic minority communities. Um, we have a good following. Um, but I write this so that you can follow us as well. We have uh, Facebook and Twitter. Um, we also release policy statements on various issues. And I think that's one thing that's important for all of us on the line. Um, if you are a mental health provider or provider of any sort, to know that there are ways that we can still be politically active um, even though we might be stressed out or overworked or feel like we might not have the time, um, that perhaps things like policy um, statements or educating others might be ways that we can uh, further the, the narrative and to, to advocate for our community's needs. So given all that, let's talk about the cultural context of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Um, so I'm sure people know some of these facts. I'm going to briefly go through this. Um, the term Asian American uh, refers to um, any person with origins and uh, the original peoples of the Far East, of Southeast Asia, of the Indian subcontinent, um, and 
includes over 40 di distinct ethnicities. Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial ethnic minority group in the United States. Uh, right now, we're almost 5% of the population, um, with an additional 4 million identifying as multiracial Asian Americans. Um, we're projected to increase to 40 million by the year 2050, so about 9% of the U.S. population. So that's roughly um, one out of every 10 people in 2050 will be Asian, Asian American. Um, we account for one third of all immigrant arrivals since the 1970s. And our largest, the largest ethnic group includes Chinese, Filipino, Asian, Indian, Vietnamese, and Korean. Um, I think I'd like to point out the largest ethnic group differences um, because a lot of times when people think about Asian Americans, they tend to think of East Asians. So, so while Chinese Americans are still the largest Asian American population, it's important to notice that Filipino, Asian, and Indian, and Vietnamese Americans um, are in second, third, and fourth place if, if we were in a race, um, and show, showing that uh, perhaps we need to be more inclusive of when we talk about Asian American issues to know that it, it, it should not be just East Asian centered. Um, Pacific Islanders I'm going to talk about today, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Um, many know that Native Americans and or Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are their own distinct category. However, oftentimes uh, they are uh, lumped into an umbrella of, of AAPIs, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, and there are both positives and negatives to that, positives being that we um, can support each other and be a cohesive, supportive community, a negative is that oftentimes issues affecting Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are often overlooked or assumed to be similar to that of Asian Americans. And so I'm going to talk about Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders today um, with the caveat of knowing that there still needs to be so much more research that's done specifically on them. But some basic information, um, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders um, make up about 1.4 million people in the U.S. population, and so about the largest number of Pacific Islanders are Native Hawaiians, followed by Samoans, followed by uh, Chamorros. Um, it's projected by 2050 that there will be about 2.6 million Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders individuals in the United States. So I want to mention that as I give this very brief presentation in and of itself, um, to recognize that the uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community is is very diverse, that there is a vast heterogeneity of our community. We have 40 plus ethnicities, like I mentioned, um, hundreds of religions and spiritual practices, multiple generations in the United States. I met the other day somebody who's six generations Filipino American. Um, so knowing that just that in itself is going to lead to so many different experiences. Um, we have the various immigration experiences. We have some folks who came over as refugees, others who came over post-1965, like my parents. Um, we have a spectrum of gender, gender identity, and sexual orientation, um, as well as the diversity of social class. So when a lot of times when people think about Asian Americans, they think of the model minority myth, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, but it's important to recognize that there are lots of Asian American groups um, that aren't doing very well, and in fact are uh, performing educationally and in terms of social class, um, have lower socioeconomic status. Uh, than other Asian Americans and often are at the poverty level. So these are things that we'll talk about today as well. So I, I say the caveat to recognize that when I do talk about these different groups to know that it might not apply to every single person in the Asian American community and that some specific communities might actually have uh, different experiences than from what I present. Um, so let's first talk about some general Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander cultural values. Um, so over the past uh, 40 years or so, there's been in, uh, research that's been conducted to really try to understand what it means to be Asian or Asian American. Um, a lot of this research is in, uh, in the social sciences, but also there's some in humanities and in uh, education where people are trying to identify what is it that makes Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders um, who we are and, and what, what uh, informs our experience as well, uh, in, in, as well as our families and our identities. Um, so one of the first values that is more to know about is this idea of filial piety. So filial piety, um, and it's uh, termed different things in different specific ethnic communities. So in, in Tagalog, it's Utah Nang Loob, in um, some South Asian communities, and they refer to it as Dharma. Um, but it essentially refers to this idea that um, that you, uh, you, you want to give back to your communities. You want to uh, put others' needs before your own. That there's a debt of gratitude that you have for your families and your communities. Um, and so oftentimes, uh, parents um, expect their children to, um, to do things for them without question, um, because that's just how it's been for centuries. 
Um, and so this idea of filial piety is a very related to collectivism, which is this notion that everybody is supposed to get along and um, people aren't supposed to fight and people um, are supposed to be very supportive of each other, um, which can clash directly with American values of individualism, um, doing what's best for you. Um, so for example, uh, in, in the United States, uh, college students are often encouraged to uh, choose a major that is most interesting for them and to not think about what your parents want you to do. Um, however, for many of us who come from uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander communities know that um, something as, as uh, innocuous as choosing a major can be very culturally related where you want to um, please your parents, you want to think best about how you can provide for your family and your extended family in the future, and so um, perhaps View, uh, choosing a major based on interest alone might be viewed as a selfish or individualistic thing. Um, with uh, filial piety comes respect, and that's this idea of respecting your elders. And so while most communities respect their elders, Asian Americans are taught to respect their elders even more. So um, the notion of talking back to your parents is something that um, was unheard of um, in the past, that you just did what your parents did, versus in general American culture, um, oftentimes teenagers and young people are taught that it's okay and acceptable to speak your mind, especially um, if it is something you believe in, um, and even if it goes against uh, what your parents or other authority figures might believe in. Um, indirect communication is a notion that Asian American Pacific Islanders tend not to, uh, to directly communicate, particularly if it's related to conflict. So for example, if, um, if I'm mad at someone, I'm probably not going to tell them that I'm mad at them. I might not yell at them. I might not get in a fight with them. Um, perhaps I might be passive and just hold it all in and not tell anyone. Um, or maybe I mean, it might be passive aggressive. So passive aggressive can range from everything from you know slamming doors or um, being really cold to somebody but not telling them why I'm being cold to them um, to even just gossiping or um, talking direct indirectly through someone else. So if I'm mad at my brother, I'm going to tell my cousin about it who's then expected to tell my brother, so we're communicating through a third party. Um, and so indirect communication um, is something, again, that can be considered very Asian and Pacific Islander. Um, however, in American culture, we're taught to be assertive. We're taught to um, to be direct with people, to, to share what's on our minds. Um, if you go to a human resources training, they'll tell you to be assertive. Um, and that's the most valued form of communication versus with Asian Americans and with Pacific Islanders, that might not be the case. Um, the conformity to norms, this is the notion that people should be most like their communities, that you're not supposed to stand out, you're not supposed to be different, you're not supposed to make waves, um, you're supposed to follow tradition and do um, what is expected of you. Um, and so with American culture, you're taught to be different, you can express yourself however you like, um, you can express your fashion, you can express your identity, um, you can uh, have interests that uh, you, whatever you're interested in, and so um, knowing that with Asian culture, if, if you do conform to norms, that there might be some backlash, um, both internally and with uh, your community and your family. Um, emotional self-control is something that we see in a lot of Asian communities, but not necessarily all. So, um, for example, um, Filipino Americans and other Pacific Islanders might be a little bit more emotionally expressive um, than other Asian American groups. Um, and that might be due to other cultural factors and colonization and so forth. Um, but generally, Asian Americans are taught to restrict their feelings, that we're not supposed to cry, we're not supposed to tell people when we're sad, um, we're not supposed to tell people when we have problems, um, we're not supposed to seek help when we need it, we're just supposed to be in control, um, try to take care of it, and uh, try not to bother anyone in the process. So it's very uh, humble, it's very, um, uh, selfless in a lot of ways, but when we think about mental health, it might have um, some negative impact on how we cope with our various life problems. Um, there is a general family recognition through achievements that this goes along with the collectivism piece that Asian American Pacific Islanders, um, because we're so collective, uh, that when somebody does something well, that we want to recognize them and they, uh, they represent the family and the family honor and the family, um, the, the respect that the family gets. Um, and so that can be a very positive thing. However, there are some downsides. One is that 
if uh, there's so much pressure on a person to achieve to represent their family, um, then that might be very daunting for somebody, particularly if they're having difficulty achieving. So we see a lot of college students, for example, um, who start off as pre-med majors and then drop out, and, um, and then they feel as if they brought shame to the family. Um, and then the other piece is when you don't do something that brings uh, achievement or recognition or something positive, um, then that can lead to some shame and stigma. Um, so, for example, if a teenager gets pregnant or uh, if somebody gets arrested, um, goes to jail in the family, that can bring some deep shame to the family. Um, and then finally, the last value I'll mention today is humility. Um, and this is just the notion that Asian American Pacific Islanders generally tend to be humble, that they tend not to, uh, to seek attention, they tend not to um, to want to bother anyone. They tend to be uncomfortable when people recognize their positive traits. Um, and so uh, this might manifest uh, in different ways and, and might have impacts on mental health. So for example, um, if I'm humble and I don't want to bother anybody, um, then perhaps if I develop some sort of mental health issue that I'm not going to want to tell anyone about it. Um, and then if you know that other people are humble and don't want to be bothered um, and that they have this emotional self-control that maybe you're not going to tell them either because you know that this is something that we as a community or our different families don't do. Um, I want to just give a quick shout out to Dr. Brian Kim at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, um, and he's developed an Asian American value scale, and basically what he found um, with his work with various Asian American communities is that there tend to be five um, values that are at least empirically, quantitatively, and statistically supported, um, and the, I've spoken to some of these before, and one is collectivism, um, conformity to norms, emotional self-control, family recognition, and humility, and Dr. Kim and others have done uh, work using the scale and have found that um, with many of these, uh, these values that oftentimes, um, that depending on what you're measuring, that there might be certain mental health outcomes that might come out of this. So I know that um, the value scale has been related to depression, related to um, help-seeking behaviors, um, and so this is something that you might want to look into in the future if you're interested in, um, in empirical research. Um, I really want to talk about the model minority myth, which we know cues Asian Americans as well educated, successful, career-driven, and law-abiding citizens. And when you talk to some people, they might say that, well, what's wrong with the model minority myth? That's great. That means they're viewing Asian Americans as being good, and they're viewing Asian Americans as being something that others should model themselves after. Um, well, there are a few problems. One is that there are there's a fallacies of the myth um, for many Asian American subgroups, but there are actually a lot of Asian Americans um, who are not doing well at all. So Southeast Asians, um, Pacific Islanders who are lumped into the Asian American umbrella, um, that oftentimes their uh, educational dis disparities are actually quite the opposite to what this model minority myth is. Um, I, I know there was a study from a few years ago that found that um, their sample of Hmong Americans, um, that most of them uh, had not graduated from eighth grade, um, and these are adults. And so this is showing that um, you know, while the model minority myth is, is glamorizing Asian Americans in one way, that it also isn't speaking on um, the realities of other parts of the Asian American community. Um, the model minority myth also assumes that mental health problems are minimal for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, because Asian Americans are able to be successful, that they're able to, um, to advance in their careers, that they're able to do well in school, um, that that must mean that they don't have any mental health problems because um, they're doing well. And so therefore, um, they're uh, on top of uh, their game, that they're coping well, that they're having good lives. And when, when in fact we find that uh, Asian Americans um, might have mental health issues because of the model minority myth and some of the expectations um, that are uh, given to them. Um, model minority myth also uh, leads to this tension with other communities of color. Um, so for example, um, with African Americans and Latinos and Native Americans, um, they might be given the message of, why aren't you more like the Asian Americans, which might lead to some tension. Um, and then it might lead to uh, Asian Americans hearing um, the, the notion of why you are better than those other minority groups, which then leads to uh, this, uh, a lot of anti-black, anti-Latino sentiments, and so 
um, it leads for the communities to fight against each other. And so while people view it as a positive thing, um, it's important to know uh, that, it, uh, it, that it's something that we should um, continue to fight. Um, uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders often lumped in this myth that despite educational and social cultural disparities, um, for me I believe that that is a direct result of just people not even knowing what, what Native Hawaiian communities and Pacific Islander communities are like, um, and so they just uh, homogenize them as being part of the Asian American diaspora. Um, the last piece that I'm not, they don't have on the slide, but one thing to think about with the model minority myth is how does it lead to discrimination or to microaggressions? Um, so, for example, if uh, people presume that all Asian Americans are smart, um, how might that lead to um, people presuming that all Asian Americans would um, would be good at math and sciences, or people who presume that uh, Asian Americans don't have any academic problems, and so then there aren't any scholarships that are offered for Asian Americans, or any resources or support services that are offered for them. Um, and so, to just recognize that uh, model minority myth can lead to various forms of discrimination. Um, so let's talk about mental health issues and treatment among our communities. So but first, to know that there are certain beliefs about mental health um, that many of our communities have. And again, um, our communities are very diverse, so it might manifest a little bit differently. Um, but generally, cultural stigma and shame is common in most Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander communities. If you think about the history of our various countries, um, that we don't hear much about mental health problems. Um, there is a lot of uh, talk about honor and a lot of talk about um, you know, family histories and that sort of thing, but, but we don't talk about the bad things. Um, uh, versus when you do some of the, if you do some oral histories or you talk to people in your family, you might be quite surprised to hear that perhaps somebody did suffer from depression, or maybe perhaps someone was schizophrenic in the family. Um, but it's something that we don't talk about. And part of that is that, uh, that there's so much shame that that brings to our families, that we don't want to uh, even acknowledge it, um, because in acknowledging it, then that somehow brings our, our family name and our family honor down. Um, another common thing with a lot of our communities is the systematization of physical health issues. So what this means is that sometimes um, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders uh, will have physical health issues. Um, they'll go to their physicians and they'll discover that there actually is nothing physically wrong with them. Um, so they're somatizing these, these health issues, um, which means that perhaps there are psychological issues uh, that they're facing or dealing with um, that they don't have the capacity to deal with mentally. Um, and so therefore, it ends up in your physical uh, health. Um, so think about for yourself about how, um, you know, when you're very stressed, uh, sometimes you're so stressed and you don't have enough time to sleep or to exercise or um, to, to reach out to your support system. And then you start noticing that your back hurts or you start noticing that you have stomach issues, or you start noticing that you get these really intense headaches all the time. Um, so oftentimes that could be physical health actually manifesting, that your body is actually um, reacting to some of your stress. And then other times it might just be somatization, which means that uh, you're psychologically you're not able to deal with anything, and so now it's just manifesting um, in, your, uh, in your physical health. Um, it's important to remember what I said before, that emotional restriction is common um, for both men and women. So while in American culture, um, men of various racial ethnic groups um, are taught to be emotionally restricted, women are actually um, a little bit more able or, or encouraged even um, to be emotional, to be expressive, to, um, to have feelings and to talk and to share those feelings. But within many Asian American communities, that emotional restriction um, is, is actually a big part of, of our communication. Um, that even women, Asian American women, oftentimes don't tell their other Asian American women friends or family members about when they're feeling sad. Um, that is just something that's not encouraged. So while the general gender norm is that women are allowed to be emotionally expressive in Asian American communities, um, sometimes that trumps that and, and that uh, Asian American women aren't um, as expressive or emotionally uh, expressive to each other. Um, we also know that a lot of people in our community will utilize spirituality and religion um, in coping with their problems. So instead of seeing a, a therapist, um, they might go to their priest or their shaman or um, some other spiritual advisor. 
um, and they won't view it as a mental health problem, but perhaps might view it as more of a spirituality problem. Um, and then finally, many Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders believe in fatalism, um, which is this idea of leaving things up to God or, or a higher power or faith. Um, and while that might be positive in a lot of ways, um, so for example, if one is diagnosed with cancer, that that might just be accepting um, that you have this disease and learning to cope with it. Um, for others, it might be believing in fatalism so much that you you lose all of your uh, your own self-efficacy, uh, your ability to take control of your life. So for example, in the same notion with uh, cancer that I mentioned, um, there have been some studies that have found that lots of Filipina women with cancer who have been diagnosed with cancer actually don't seek any treatment because they believe that that's their fate um, versus somebody who, um, who might have more self-efficacy is somebody who might um, go to their doctor, might get some chemo, some chemo treatment um, because they still believe that they have some control over their lives. So in terms of mental health treatment, there have been some common themes um, over the past 40 years with a lot of research emerging in the 1970s with some of the founders of the Asian American Psychological Association. Um, and what we found over time is that Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders utilize counseling services least out of all of the racial ethnic groups, so compared to African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, um, white European Americans, that Asian Americans um, receive counseling services the least. Um, and that they seek counseling services when symptoms are most severe. So what this means is that um, while they're not generally going to seek counseling services or any sort of psychological services, that they will go when things have gotten out of control. So for example, when somebody is so depressed that they're now suicidal, perhaps that's when they're first able to go to seek counseling versus talking to or seeking out a therapist when maybe they're first starting to feel a little sad or depressed or despondent. Um, with uh, schizophrenia, a lot of times Asian Americans um, and Pacific Islanders, a family member might be displaying some signs of schizophrenia, um, but it isn't until the person has a psychotic break with very extreme hallucinations or, or uh, delusions that that's when the person, the family decides to check them in. Um, and so we see that uh, while people might say, oh, Asian Americans just don't have any mental health issues in general um, because they don't seek counseling service, it could also be said that there's so much stigma um, in, in the communities and that's why they don't seek counseling services. Um, what we also have found is that just in general, providers aren't culturally competent, um, that there are very few bilingual uh, therapists who can provide uh, psychotherapy for many immigrant communities who don't speak English or where English is their second language. Um, and many Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are often misdiagnosed, meaning that they're given a diagnosis based on Western standards, um, when in reality there might be some other cultural implications. And I'm going to talk about that, or at least a few examples of that in a, in a bit. So the NLAS studies um, measured uh, a, a thousand or two thousand Asian Americans um, in the year 2002-2003. It's one of the largest um, Asian American national studies uh, in the a longer time, versus where the, whereas they have a lot of national studies that look at African Americans or Asian Americans tend not to have these national studies. Um, what those reports have found are some of these, the following. Um, one is that Asian Americans report lower rates of mental illness than whites. Um, Asian Americans are less likely to seek help for their emotional or mental health problems, which we already know. Um, Asian Americans were born in the United States or immigrated at a young age, had higher rates of mental illness. Uh, participants who experience more discrimination report higher rates of depression. And specifically, Vietnamese Americans are more likely to seek help than any other Asian ethnic group. Now, let's just break some of this down, at least the parts we haven't talked about yet. Um, one is that Asian Americans report lower rates of mental illness than white. So if a lot of Asian Americans hear this, they might say something like, oh, that means that we, we have less problems, we're, we're totally fine. Um, but however, perhaps they report lower rates of mental illness because of this cultural stigma or shame. Maybe they don't want to admit to their problems. Um, or maybe their problems manifest in such a way that they don't even realize that they're having mental health problems um, because it's so normalized for them. So I'll give some examples of that in a bit. Um, Asian Americans who were born in the United States or immigrated at a young age had higher rates of mental illness. So some people might say, see, the Americans, that when you become more Americanized, um, that you're going to have mental illness. Um, or perhaps it might be that Asian Americans um, who were born in the United States or have lived here for most of their life 
um, that they're more able to identify their mental illness or they're more able to seek help um, as a result of that. Um, something that's interesting is that participants experience more discrimination, um, report higher rates of depression, um, and that's something that has been studied for the past 20 or 30 years, the notion that um, discrimination has a huge impact on our health, and uh, which includes our physical health and our mental health, and so that's something that we need to continue to study. Um, and then finally, the, this ethnic-specific finding that Vietnamese Americans um, are more likely to seek help. Um, some authors have, have stated that perhaps this, the reason for this is that because so many Vietnamese uh, immigrants came over as refugees, um, that uh, dealing with PTSD, that maybe uh, as a community um, there had been less stigma or um, more of a need to seek mental health services. And that's something we can talk about later if folks are interested. Um, Daryl Tzu and, and colleagues have, co have compiled just some of the, the basic presenting problems for Asian Americans when they seek counseling. Um, the number one thing is always academic. So I used to work in a college counseling center, um, and lots of young people would come in and, and say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm having difficulties with my classes, I'm not doing well. Um, and as you talk to them further, you hear that they're really stressed, that there are a lot of family problems that they're dealing with, maybe some identity issues that they're dealing with. Um, and so for while uh, older Asian Americans might go to their, their doctors um, or their physicians with their physical symptoms, um, a lot of younger people go to their college counseling centers or their high school counseling um, centers and complain of academic issues. Um, just briefly going through some of this stuff, uh, so there's lots of some Asian American folks will um, talk about interpersonal issues, some have issues with substance abuse, dating, bicultural and biracial issues, so navigating being multiracial, um, some family difficulties doing, due to the emerging cultural differences, so being American born versus having immigrant parents, um, and then feeling marginalized, feeling uh, difficult, having difficulty relating um, within other various subgroups of Asian Americans, and um, even having direct experiences with racism. Um, and this is just a quick overview. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some specific uh, disorders. I know I don't have too much time, um, but these are some of the myths about suicide. I told you a little bit about our fact sheet um, and how uh, we wanted to de debunk a lot of these myths that exist. Um, so, for example, a lot of times people say that Asian Americans have higher suicide rates than other racial ethnic groups, um, when in reality uh, the rate for Asian Americans is about the same. Um, that Asian Americans have uh, higher suicide rates um, than other racial ethnic groups, that we find that Asian American college students um, might have higher rates of suicidal thoughts, but that there actually is no evidence that there are actual higher rates of suicide. Um, and that young Asian American, age 15 to 24, have highest suicide rates of in comparison to all racial ethnic groups, when in fact the reality is that American Indian and Alaskan Native had the highest suicide rate of, with that population. What we do know is that suicide was the eighth leading cause of death for Asian Americans um, versus being 11th for the general U.S. population. So just ranking-wise, we see that it might be a little bit more um, prevalent, but not necessarily uh, meaning uh, numbers-wise. Um, Asian American women um, aged 65 to 84 are the highest suicide rate compared to all U.S. women in that same age group. So Asian American elderly women um, might commit suicide more than other uh, racial ethnic groups of, of women in that same age. Um, U.S. born um, Asian American women had a higher prevalence of suicidal thoughts than the general U.S. population. Um, and so suicidal thoughts doesn't always lead to suicide, um, but it is important to realize how suicidal thoughts might have an impact on mental health and even physical health. Um, Asian American adults between 18 and 34 have higher rates of suicidal thoughts, intent, and attempts, and Asian American college students are more likely than white to have suicidal thoughts or attempts. So this is where some of the research may have, or some of the myths may have started based on some of this research, um, that yes, it looks like that younger people do have suicidal thoughts um, and maybe even attempts, but there really isn't um, any data that shows or supports that they have uh, actual completed suicides that are higher than the general population. Um, in terms of schizophrenia, a lot of times people think that maybe that there's a higher rate of schizophrenia with Asian Americans. Um, schizophrenia tends to have the same, uh, or tends to affect about 1% of the U.S. population. Um, and Asian Americans, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders tend to have a very similar prevalence um, compared to that. So those similar 1% of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders might be affected with schizophrenia. However, there might be some cultural bound sim symptoms on how schizophrenia manifests. So for example, 
Asian American specific islanders with schizophrenia in this sample um, were more likely to commit suicide than their white counterparts. Um, the sample found that auditory hallucinations were more common in whites, which is very interesting and important because a lot of times people think of hallucinations, the people who see or hear things or taste things that aren't there. Um, that tends to be a very uh, a prominent factor in people determining whether someone has schizophrenia. Um, but if Asian Americans um, aren't manifesting those symptoms, um, then perhaps this is why people don't even realize that they might have schizophrenia or be diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, Asians were more likely to show neglected activities, lose appetite, be irritable. Um, whites were twice as likely to have somatic complaints and perform violent acts as compared to Asians. So this is, again, something that's more very important because a lot of times people think that uh, people with schizophrenia are violent, and when you're violent and it's irrational, that perhaps that might be a sign of schizophrenia versus Asian Americans might not be um, as violent, and so therefore people might not realize that they have uh, these mental illnesses. Um, and then whites were more likely to suggest that others are responsible for the onset of their mental illness um, compared to Asians who are likely to take responsibility for their condition. Um, so they think this is a big difference in individualism versus collectivism, that for these Asian Americans, that they, uh, they, they don't blame others, that it's, it's something that they take more responsibility for, that they're not, um, they're not focusing on, on blaming other people besides themselves. Um, I'm just going to briefly talk about some specific ethnic group mental health and behavioral health issues that are interesting and, and need to be discovered more with other ethnic groups. Um, so Vietnamese Americans in California, in California were twice as likely as whites to report mental health problems, but were less likely to discuss such issues with their physician. Um, so showing that Vietnamese people um, are, uh, they, they are able to report these mental health issues, but that there's still a stigma in reporting them to their physician. Um, some studies have found depression to be higher in Filipino Americans than in the general American population, and for schizophrenia to be more prevalent um, with Filipino Americans than with other Asian Americans. Um, and Native Hawaiian youth have the highest rates of substance abuse in Hawaii on comparison to other racial and ethnic groups. So knowing that substance abuse, um, while a lot of times people don't classify it as being a medical health issue, is very much related um, because oftentimes we see that people with substance abuse use disorders um, often have a, a dual diagnosis with other um, pressing issues like depression or um, anxiety and so forth. Um, Moving along, just some cultural considerations, um, just food for thought that we don't have time to explore too much. Um, a lot of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders are sometimes diagnosed with schizophrenia. Like I mentioned before, a lot of times they're misdiagnosed. However, oftentimes it may be a, a normal coping method of dealing with death. Um, so for example, a, a widow may claim her deceased husband visits her. Um, does that mean she absolutely sees him and um, that she's hallucinating um, and that you need to take her to the hospital? Um, that you need to put her on medication, or could it be that that's just a cultural way of her dealing with her, uh, her husband's death? Um, some Filipino Americans may suffer from what's called a smiling depression, and I would argue that this happens with other Asian American Pacific Islander communities as well, um, in which they do not ex exhibit external symptoms. So they don't have difficulty eating, they don't have difficulty sleeping or functioning, um, but rather they repress or hide all internal symptoms. So they're feeling really sad or worthless, but yet they're getting through the day. So versus somebody who's significantly depressed, um, oftentimes we view them as somebody who can't get out of bed in the morning um, and is just having a really difficult time versus a lot of these Filipino Americans um, that they uh, might be able to cover that and no one would ever know that they are actually depressed. And so it's a very culturally, uh, cultural manifestation of how depression might look differently for this community. Um, in terms of counseling, I'm going to go through this really briefly. Um, in general, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders tend to defer to authority figures. So once you can get them into the counseling sessions, to know um, that if you're their therapist, that oftentimes you're viewed as the authority figure. Um, culturally responsive counselors are viewed as more expert, attractive, trustworthy than culturally neutral counselors, meaning that it's important to talk about culture in the room. Um, to not be colorblind, to, uh, to ask them about how their culture and their family affect their, their problems, their presenting problems, their coping, and so forth. Um, counselors who communicate through direct and indirect ways are viewed as positively, so to be both direct and indirect. Um, for many Asian Americans, directive counselors are viewed as more positive than non-directive insight-oriented counselors. A lot of Asian Americans, um, Pacific Islanders, go into a counseling session wanting you to solve their problems. Um, and so that might be viewed as positive for some. Um, but uh, what some of the research is finding is that Filipino and Pacific Islander clients may actually prefer expressive 
and interpersonal relationships in their counseling. So it actually matches um, a lot of what uh, the literature on Latino um, clients uh, that they might, what they might prefer. Um, and so in conclusion, how can we address um, Asian American, Pacific Islander mental health issues on individual, community, and federal level. So I'm assuming that people will have some ideas that we could talk about as well, but these are just some things to start with. Um, so one, on individual levels, I think it's really important to normalize mental health issues and treatment, meaning that um, I think we shouldn't be afraid to talk about when we have problems. Um, when someone says, how are you, I and mean, there's somebody that you care about and feel close to, I think it's okay to say, you know, I've actually been feeling really depressed lately as opposed to what is uh, socially acceptable to say everything's fine, I'm good, um, and not to share your problems. But why not normalize um, mental health issues? I think one way that we can normalize mental health issues is um, for people to, who are in therapy to talk about therapy in the same way that you would talk about going to the dentist or going to get a haircut. Um, to say things like, oh, what are you doing today? Oh, yeah, I have class and then I have to go to therapy, and then I'm going to be with my mom. Um, and talking about it in that way, um, it does a couple things. One, um, it lessens the stigma because you're talking about something um, that you're viewing as normal, and therefore hopefully someone else will view that as normal. Um, and two, um, it becomes something that people can do even when they don't necessarily have any severe mental health issues. So a lot of times people think that they need to be completely depressed to go to therapy, um, when in reality, like even just to process your emotions or to talk about um, salient issues in your life, um, that therapy can be the place for that. Um, and so to, to really uh, to normalize them in that way is really important. Um, encourage others to seek mental health treatment, particularly if you are. Tell them about what it's like. Provide some education of what they can expect so they're not so scared of it. Um, and know your resources. So know um, about uh, who uh, what types of providers are out there, um, if you can refer um, either an Asian American Pacific Islander or just a culturally competent um, non-API um, as a therapist to, to share that with others as well. Um, in community, I think one of the most important things is to discuss mental health, health issues in your organization. I think a lot of times um, people just don't discuss these issues at all. Um, I think one way that we can at least start that conversation is to promote balance um, and self-care. So uh, in your organization meeting, when you're talking about your, your events and your conferences and your protests and um, your advocacy, um, why not have a time in your agenda to talk about how um, people are taking care of themselves? Why not have some time for some meditation or some yoga um, or even just uh, talking about just your day and what, what are some of the, the mental health challenges of, of your work position? And then finally, how can you address these things on national levels? I mean, I'm sure in CAPA we'll talk more um, and can provide much more information um, about the ACA. Um, but knowing that different uh, policies affect various communities, and so it's important for us to know um, what's out there and how we can advocate um, for that. So for example, uh, people who don't have um, insurance um, in general, like that's problematic, but there are a lot of people who don't have mental health insurance, and so perhaps they would like to go to mental health treatment, but they don't have the access or they have limited um, limited visits with their, uh, their psychotherapist, and so perhaps we need to advocate for that on more national levels. Um, and then the last thing that I will encourage is to become a researcher or to do research um, uh, on our communities, by our communities. Um, our research is, is one way that uh, we can tell the story about what's happening in our community. Um, I think when we uh, are able to speak about our own issues um, through our own voices, whether it's uh, qualitative um, in, in doing um, interviews and focus groups or quantitative, even just uh, crunching numbers and analyzing statistics, um, I think we, we are covering the topics that need to be covered as opposed to waiting for somebody um, to decide that they're interested in studying Asian American issues um, or waiting for somebody to, uh, to actually care about our communities um, when they perhaps uh, might not even be aware that our communities exist. So think about ways that we can either become researchers um, or even encourage others to go into graduate school to get their doctorates and um, their masters um, and to do research that can really have a significant impact on our communities. And with that, thank you for listening, and I'm open to questions, and I guess we have about four more minutes. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Kevin. A lot of great information that you shared. Um, if there's any questions that folks have, please type them into your box. You know, as, as Kevin mentioned, we have about five minutes left to take any questions. So if there's any questions, please type them into your box and I can ad, um, address those to Kevin. Um, just quite one question, Kevin. Are there any studies or interventions that have shown some effective strategies to increase the utilization of counseling services for A's and NHPIs? Yeah, there, there have been some studies more recently that have been looking at how to use technology um, in increasing more access. So um, Asian Americans in general, APIs in general, um, because there's so much stigma, maybe they don't want to go to the therapist's office, particularly if you live in a small town and if you go to a, a, therapy's, a therapist's office that someone might see you and that sort of thing. Um, and so there's been some research that find that things like chat rooms and, and video t uh, conferencing might be an option. And, and I think that's great, but I also think that um, there, there needs to be um, much more uh, besides just technology. I think there's, there's, there's some movement now in terms of um, just outreach, so for therapists to be part of the community. Um, and so that it's problematic in, in a couple of ways. One is that a lot of times we don't have enough API therapists at all. So to even find an Asian American therapist is, is one thing. Um, and then two, because of that, if you have non-Asian Americans, um, they might not be as, as interested or invested in becoming part of the community. But, but outreach and being present in the community can be something um, that is definitely helpful and effective. Great, thank you. So we've got a lot of questions coming in and maybe what we can do is compile all the questions and then send out some type of synopsis later. But um, just I'm trying to summarize a couple of them. Um, what can we say to encourage young adults um, to seek counseling or to get somebody into counseling? How can we help people get into counseling? And then another kind of question is, are there any other specific medications that work better or worse on AAPIs? Okay, I'll answer the Asian and the, the medication question first. Um, I, as far as I know, there aren't medications that work specifically. I think everyone's body is different, and even um, race. I think that uh, that there there haven't been any medications that are found to be specifically uh, more effective for Asian Americans specific others. Um, but the second piece, how do we encourage more people? So going along with the normalizing piece, I think um, another thing that we can do is to be more public in talking about our usage of mental health services. Um, I know that I've written about going to therapy and just what that would be like. I think if more people did that, um, that I think that would be helpful. So not just normalizing it amongst your friends and your circles, um, but for like leaders in communities to talk about going to therapy. Um, so if you're a leader in, in a community organization um, and for your that meeting, you're talking about uh, mental health issues for somebody to just be really overt and intentional of saying, like, yeah, I've gone to therapy and it's really helpful, and I've gone to some therapy and it's not helpful, or, or I didn't like my therapist. But just having that conversation, I think, really normalizes um, the situation. Thank you. And I think we have time for one final question. So one question is, is there a national resource list that those who are working with AAPIs the API community can access to see what types of support are available in their area of practice or to connect clients directly? Mm, that's a great question. Um, so I think NCAPA can be a part for the just organizing um, different uh, Asian American Pacific Islander like organizations in general just to know what's out there um, in different states and different regions. Um, but in terms of specific like uh, client resources, um, that's something that we can work on, um, but just we haven't had the time and the resources to do that. Um, AAPA, the Asian American Psychological Association, if you were to email our uh, like our listserv or our, our webmaster, um, we are more than happy to send out referrals if you ever have a referral question. Um, so for example, if you live in I don't know, yesterday I sent out a referral for Lowell, Massachusetts. Someone emailed me asking for a referral, um, and so I sent that, and within a day at least one person has replied saying, how about this? So I think that, that if, if people are interested, I'd be happy to, to compile that into an actual website of where are the various therapists across the country, um, but I think that's something that would take 
some time, and so um, would definitely appreciate any help that people could give. Right. Great. Thank you. So I think we're out of time. I think Kevin, is it okay if people email you with any other questions? Yes. Um, so my email have? address is is on the slide. So feel free to email me at that email address right there. Great. Thank you very much. Again, this webinar is being recorded. Um, and I think we can also post the slides as well on the NCAPA website. So some of, some of you were asking about that as well. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining. Thank you again, Kevin, for the, for the presentation. Um, thank you to Kelly and Isha as well for talking about NCAPA. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.